shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of every lie. There is no escape. Proverbs 19.5 I will tell the truth for Every lie Proverbs 19.5 A false witness Shall not be unpunished And he that speaketh lies Shall not escape A false witness Shall not be unpunished And he that speaketh lies Shall not escape Proverbs 19.5 Hello everybody and welcome to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we have another wonderful Sabbath day, the 22nd of uh, September already in 2018. The year is really going fast to its closure. I have the feeling um, that the years are going faster and faster. <laughs> the days are probably going faster and faster too. And today we really have the very first fall day with a lot of rain. Um, it really started this afternoon, but I could take a walk this morning, that was nice. But this afternoon it is cold, so I'm sitting here even with a jacket on, something I haven't done for months. So that tells me that the year is really going to its close. And I'm connected uh, via Skype, luckily because of a uh, very lucky incident of a new computer that brother Michael found, that he can join us today via Skype in the reading that we are going to start now of Simon Peter versus Simon Magus, the 13th uh, video, if I'm not mistaken, we are going to take on today. And Michael is connected with me and Brett in America is connected with me. But first I want to go to Michael and uh, welcome him to the broadcast. Hello, Michael. Yes, hello everybody. And today is another lecture of Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. So the good side versus the evil side. And we all know where which one will win in the end, don't we? Yeah, that's why I Indeed. sometimes don't understand why people even join the side that is going to lose in the end. But, you know, we don't understand people. Hi, Brett. You were already Hi. mentioning something. Good. Yeah. Well, you know, you have the wheat and the tares, right? So the tares, they like the little gadgets and goodies that you get in this life. And and the wheat doesn't uh, really care for that too much. Uh you know, it's uh, it's more about uh, getting things properly in order, you know, uh, obeying the proper principles to keep things in line for uh, the truth, because it's all about the truth in the end anyway. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all a battle over, over uh, who we regard for truth, isn't it? So we have this uh, incredible antichrist system. Um, this horrible, dreaded beast that we're living in, you know. And uh, wow, so here we are, uh, the first and second beast. <laughs> <laughs> Joined together. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that, uh, please. That's an interesting parable you were just stating about uh, the wheat and the tares. If you think about it, the wheat, as you, uh, as you said, we are, the, the people of God here on earth, um, mm -hmm. We are nothing worth out of our own because wheat first has to be grained down to flour and then the flour has to be baked to become a bread and is then even tried in an oven. So that really needs to be worked on instead of the tares that is not going to be worked on, that is just going to be taken and burned. But ah, the wheat needs yes. to be worked on. And this is what the yes. Holy Spirit does with us all our lives that we are here on the earth. He guides us to the truth and he works on us so that we will be justified and uh, sanctified when we meet our Lord Jesus Christ. Whether when he comes at the second, uh, at the second event or when we will be raised up for the hopefully first resurrection where we will all be in. And all what we are doing here on this earth right now is a sanctifying process because justification is instantly by the grace of God. 
But sanctification is also how Tom explains that a lot. Sanctification is a li lifelong process. That is when the wheat is going to be worked on. Grain to powder and the powder made to flour and the flour mixed with water and oil, oil or wine, and then baked in an oven and then being sanctified for eternal life. I think it's quite an interesting way to look at it, right? It is. So, before we are going to start here reading and, and, and analyzing parables, we are going to get into the book reading of um, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus, or St. Peter Meets the Competition by Ernest Martin. We already have had a few broadcasts, and we are going to continue on page 22 in a, in a jiffy in a second uh, with the 13th reading, as I announced to you. But as you can see here, I put a little comment in here that I typed half an hour ago. And I'm going to announce to you that... When we are done with this book study of Ernest L. Martin, we will read chapter 10 of Babylon Mystery Religion by Ralph Woodrow, a book that I read all 22 chapters or 21 chapters already on my channel, and you can look them up. And that 10th chapter is called Was Peter the First Pope? You know, just when I did a little bit of research on the minor gods, on this god stuff that we are going to read now in the 13th part of this reading, a moment from here on now, when I did my research a little bit, I stumbled upon that I had a list of those gods in the book of Babylon Mystery Religion when I read that. And I just looked into the uh, into the contents of the of the book and I saw, like you see here, well, chapter 10, was Peter the first pope? Of course, dealing with the very same subject that we have been dealt with, or that, that we have been dealing with already, with the very first 24 pages of this um, person who published this letter on presenceofgodministry.org, then uh, taking over the book of um, Ernest L. Martin that we are reading for the moment, and then we are going to turn afterward to chapter 10 of Babylon Mystery Religion from Rev Woodrow. And by that, and that's the important point that I want to make, then we will have our point established by three witnesses as the Bible commands to reprove a liar. As we can read in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, quote, One witness shall not rise up against man for any against the man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Now this is why we are gathered here together. Michael on the second uh, on the second side on Europe, Germany. Brett over the ocean in the United States of America and me over here in Belgium, we are the three witnesses that talk to you and tell you that St. Peter, the Apostle Peter of the Bible, never was in Rome and that that Peter that was in Rome is Simon Magus, who we established already, and we three are the witnesses for that and we take to account that 24 paper PDF I read in the beginning, in the very first five broadcasts of this. We take into account Ernest L. Martin's work on this, and we take into account for the final conclusion chapter 10 of uh, Ralph Woodrow's book Babylon Mystery Religion. So, two times we will establish what we are telling you about Simon Peter and Simon Magus, and that Peter was never in Rome, by three witnesses. I Comment call that almost uh, bulletproof and uh, please Michael yeah yeah I uh, find the chapter title of Ralph Woodrow a little bit misleading because uh, you see that Peter is not a synonym also for the name or a prename but also for the the old uh, Babylonic uh, teachers and so I think that of course Peter was in Rome but it was not Simon Peter you see so I, I find this uh, title chapter a little bit misleading. Well, that is something, of course, that you notice only when you read it in English. If you would read it in, uh, if you were reading that in German, and the question was asked, "War Petrus der erste yeah. Papst?" Yeah, you're right. Then that question would not arise in this way. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you are making a very valid point. But I think that Ralph Woodrow, all throughout the book, because this is chapter ten already that Ralph Woodrow all throughout the book makes it very clear who the Antichrist is, even though he later uh, recanted of that book. Yeah? 
Mm. But that's that's another question. But it's an interesting point that you make. We are dealing with the English language, and by just calling this was Peter the first pope, chapter ten. Of course, you have a little misunderstanding maybe built in 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 the English language. But on the other hand, I tell you, this is already the tenth chapter, and the foregoing nine chapters uh, that you can read in this book make it very very clear what Peter he is talking about here and by the way he of course also speaks of uh, Simon Peter and Simon Magus later on in this chapter mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. interesting of course that you point that out okay so when you guys are ready I'd say we go start reading on uh, Ernest L. Martin's book Page 22, as you can see here on the screen. Is it okay for mm -hmm. you that I start? Please do. Okay. There were two gods of ancient Rome which were preeminently worshipped as Peter gods. One was J.U. Peter, or the Zeus Peter. The other, says the classical manual, was Janus, or uh, called Peter, or Peter, as we can see on page 389 of the... Um, source that the author is using here. Sometimes these two gods are confused, but they are to be reckoned as distinct relative to Roman paganism of the first century. The latter god, Janus Peter, had some interesting roles to play in the pagan religion at Rome. These roles answer the question, who was the original Peter of Rome? Notice a brief history and some of the activities of this god. Now, we are going into these different kind of gods here. And I prepared a little movie, a little film of just uh, three minutes, that I prepared earlier on that is taken from a website here where you can see all the Greek gods and goddesses and their meaning. And of course, you know that later on in Rome, all these Greek goddesses were just baptized with Roman gods. Therefore, I have a picture prepared that we will see later on. As you can see here, uh, Juno, Venus, Diana, Minerva, Ceres, Vesta, Jupiter, Apollo, Mars, Vulcan, Mercury and Neptune. That's it's this picture and there's even another picture that I want to show you. That's this one. Here you have the direct comparison between the Greek god and the Roman god and what the role of the god was means Ares becomes Mars, is the god of war. Zeus becomes J.U. Peter, is the chief god. Hera becomes Juno, is the wife of the chief god. Yeah, that is uh, Nimrod and Semiramis. Uh, Aphrodite becomes Venus, is the goddess of love. Artemis becomes Diana, who we also know from the Bible in the book of Acts, which is the goddess of hunt. Athena becomes Minerva, which is the goddess of wisdom. Hermes becomes Mercury, who is a messenger god. Hades becomes Pluto, who is the god of the underworld. Poseidon becomes Neptune, who is the god of the sea. And Hephaestus becomes a Vulcan, who is the god of ice. And this list can go on and on and on. So I just prepared this little movie that you can look while I'm going to continue read in this book. It's just three minutes, but have a little look at the different gods here in Greece or here in Greek that I mentioned here. So I'm going to start the movie and then I'm going to continue reading in this book. Plutarch in his life of Numa gives us the identity of Janus. Originally, according to Plutarch, Janus was an ancient prince who reigned in the infancy of the world. He brought men from a rude and savage life to a mild and rational system. He was the first to build cities and the first to establish government over men. After his death, he was deified. There can be no mistaking who this Janus was. This title was just another of the many names of Nimrod. This ancient prince, who was violently killed, was later deified by the pagan religions. Because of his high authority, he was called a Pator or Peter. And you know, Pator, you even pronounce the same as Peter. I just make the distinction between Pator and Peter that you understand that these two words are used even though they are in English pronounced the same as we learned already in an earlier episode of this reading. 
Now here are some of the religious activities of which Janus Peter was in charge. It was Janus Peter who was preeminent in interpreting the times, especially prophecy. Quote, the past and the future was always present in his mind. We can read on the classical manual pages 388 and 389. He was pictured as being double-faced. Plutarch said this was a symbol of his endeavor to change men from barbarism to civilization, that is, bring them to the civilization of Nimrod. One of Janus's role after his deification as a god was the continuation of his sacred task of quote unquote civilizing men. So I think we can say that the Pope of today is the Janus of today, right? He civilizes us in the way that he thinks we should be civilized, which is not the biblical way. But let us go a little farther. Janus Peter had keys. Oh, so the Peter god Janus was to the ancient Romans the quote-unquote keeper of the gates of heaven and earth. Ah, uh, isn't that the role the Pope takes today? He is represented with a key in one hand as emblematic of his presiding over gates and highways. Unquote. How shocking! The pagan Romans were calling their Janus a Peter hundreds of years before the birth of the Apostle Peter. It was this Janus who was in charge of the pearly gates. The very word Janus means gate, that is, the one in charge of the gates. Let's play this another time. The classical manual continues, quote, Ovid speaks of him, meaning Janus, in the first book of his Fasti. His face is doubled to denote his equal empire over the heavens and the earth. Does not the Pope claim the same power today? And that all things are open and shut to him at his will. He was infallible, as the Pope from 1870 on, when he speaks ex cathedra, and answered to no one for his actions, so like the Pope, because the Pope is the judge of all men and not to be judged by any man, according to Roman Catholic canon law. So that he governs the whole universe, the Catholicum. And alone he possesses the power of making the world resolve, uh, revolve on its axis. That he presides over the gates of heaven. Unquote. Now the Catholic or the Catholics claim to have the keys. The Catholic Church claims Peter gave, it, uh, gave to it the keys of the gates of heaven and that no one will enter into God's presence unless that church opens the gates. It's like Unam Sanctum. <laughs> it's absolutely like Unam Sanctum. Yeah. The very word cardinal means hinge. The cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church are the hinges upon which the gate, the Pope, is able to turn. The classical manual continues. And by the way, this what I'm reading here now is you get so much more information on this subject if you are going to read Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. And more compressed than Alexander Hislop's work, but still the same deeper information you get when you read Babylon Mystery Religion. I have not read Alexander Hislop's work in English, but I have read it in German, and I have read the Woodrow work of Babylon Mystery Religion in English, and I'm going to read that in German in the future, because I have the German book of that also. And that's going to be an interesting read. But for the moment, one of my German brothers is already busy um, to, <laughs> believe it or not, he is going to translate James Edkin Wiley's The Antichrist, uh, The Pope is the Antichrist, a demonstration. Already busy with that work. Just wonderful how the Spirit works lately in our life and how people all of a sudden pop up out of nowhere, more or less, and do this wonderful work to edify the whole world. But anyway, let's continue in this reading here. 
the classical manual, which we've just already mentioned a little bit earlier in the reading in the quote, continues to say, quote, The successions of day and night were regulated by his influence, and that the east and the west is at one moment open to his view. Unquote. It was Janus Peter who also controlled the calendar by his priests. Now, I didn't prepare a picture of Janus, but that's something we can do right now. Uh, no, <laughs> I have to take the right folder here. And then we're going to do a, show you a little picture of Janus that I have already on my computer. The God of Chaos, as he is also called. And um, by the way, oh yeah, I forgot to turn Skype into not disturb. I'm sorry. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, this is a picture here of uh, Janus as it is shown in picture 7 in the book of Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. And uh, you have another one where he is minted on a coin, an old Roman coin. That's this one. And also this picture is uh, Janus with the key and cock. And this is also, uh, this is I think from Ralph Woodrow's Babylon Mystery Religion, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, also three witnesses that show Janus here. Uh, let's stick with this picture here. So, it was Janus Peter who also controlled the calendar by his priests. Now, we were living uh, more than 1500 years by the Julian calendar, and then Antichrist Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, if I'm not mistaken, was it? Uh, changed the calendar in 1582 to the Gregorian calendar, of which we live right now. So mm. he is the manifestation of Janus Peter, who controlled the calendar by his priests, by the Roman Catholic Church. You see how the Pope is just the successor of this Janus Peter God, the pagans, listen to, the pagans adhere to, the pagans worship. The first month of the year was named after him to show his control over the years. Uh, January. Yeah. So today we still have January as the first month because of the change of the Gregorian calendar who changed New Year from April to January and calling the last day of the year Sylvester, after Antichrist Pope Sylvester. The Catholic Church, like the priests of Janus, feels it has this same authority over the calendar today. Now, I very much appreciate the uh, choice of words Ernest L. Martin takes into this reading here, into this book. He says... The Catholic Church feels it has the same authority over the calendar today. Because we already read in the book of Daniel that Daniel warns us that the little horn that comes out of the ten horns thinks to change times and laws. Times and laws cannot be changed. But gullible people can be made to believe different times and different laws as they are meant and introduced by our Creator God. And that's the point. So here the Catholic Church or the Antichrist, the Pope, like the priest of Janus, feels he has the same authority over the calendar today. That's why Pope Gregory changed the calendar in 1582. And they still have to do these changes as he did then because then he scrapped 11 days out of the calendar from the 4th. The next day was the 15th of October all of a sudden because they are running a 365 year solar, solar year and God created the earth with months of 30 days and 360 days a year, because otherwise all the predictions, all the prophecies of the Bible would be far off in days if we count by 365 days and not by 360. And they are not far off. The Bible is very precise, but the Antichrist is not. 
but he can make people believe whatever they want to. That's why already um, Illuminati Weishaupt said in a quote, Oh, gullible man, what can you not all made to be believe made to believe? Yeah, something like that. It's not a, it's not a word for by word quote, but that's about what Adam Weiss helped the founder of the Illuminati, uh, is quoted to say, because the people are so easily distracted by anything else but the Bible, instead of adhering to reading and studying the Word of God. The Catholic Church, like the priests of Janus, feels it has the same authority over the calendar today. It does not have it. But here for the moment in Europe, believe it or not, we have this childish, this childish discussion about are we are going to stay with the with the system that every March we change to daylight savings time and every month of October we change back to the real time, the winter time as they call it. Do you know what according to uh, a few, um, uh, how, how do they call it when, when they ask a lot of people, uh, I, I just forgot the word, help me out here. Oh, yeah, like a, a, uh, a, a poll. Survey, a survey, poll. surveys oh, or polls, yeah, uh, according yeah. to different polls. Uh, people said, no, let, let us just stay with summer time, daylight savings time. So not even with the real time, even people are so dumb that they opt for an artificial time instead of the real time that was given by our creator. And this is a discussion that is around Europe already for a few years and these polls have been made the last two years and they are going to make a quote-unquote decision on what time we have to follow according to these different polls. So I'm looking um, forward to that uh, maybe next year or the year after that we probably maybe don't even have a change to daylight savings time anymore but we are regulated under all daylight savings time living all the time not making any change of year anymore you know this is just a small point but it proves the argument that the Antichrist has power to change times and laws to change times. Nothing else. Like with this, um, uh, with this law since the 1970s in here in Europe, that the Antichrist changed the days of the week, and all of a sudden made Monday the first day of the week, and by that Sunday the seventh day of the week. That is official policy over here in Europe. Believe it or don't believe it. Look it up for yourselves. I don't care. That's the truth. Here in Europe we have Monday as the first day of the week. But good, let's go back and see if there is another name for Nimrod. But before we do that, let's just take a picture of Nimrod here, because when we are speaking about him, there is no harm in looking up a picture for him. And here we have an interesting little uh, tablet that I showed you already last time, other names for Nimrod, so you can have a look at this in the meantime. Uh, this is here of course in the very first, this is Greek, then here you have the Roman names and here you have other pagan names like in the northern gods like Odin and, and Vodan and so on and so on. So oh, have a look I, at this. Other I name for Nimrod. Yeah, please, so Michael, what, what I, do you want to I say? I smell a coincidence. <laughs> you smell a coincidence, okay. Yes, it's, it's uh, just looking up for the Greek uh, uh, content, and I just remembered seeing a sign called Eros Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I come from Hamburg, and there we have this quote-unquote, uh, this, this street which is called the Mile of Sin, uh, yeah. The Reeperbahn, and there are a lot of quote unquote Eros centers. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Interesting point you make there. Yeah. Eros, who becomes Mercury or is actually Tammuz. Okay, another name for Nimrod. So here in the, in the tablet you can look it up, and uh, I'm going to continue the reading here. 
Finally, the author says it is necessary to notice at least one more name under which Nimrod masqueraded. Uh, uh, what did Nimrod do? He masqueraded. What does the Pope do? It is said of the Pope that the Pope is Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. So, in other words, in the Roman Catholic belief system, Jesus Christ hides himself <laughs> behind a mere sinner. Huh? Masquerading. Nimrod was also masquerading. So we have a lot of history already of the Pope already going back to Babylon here. Because as Nimrod masqueraded himself, the Pope masquerades himself today, even still. So finally the author says it is necessary to notice at least one more name under which Nimrod masqueraded. The name Mithras. The Persian name for Baal, the S-U-N, Sun God. This Mithras worship of Nimrod was popular and was one of the last to plant itself in Rome. But it had a very old theme, outright Peter worship. Quote, Mithras was styled by the nations of the East Peter. His temples were Patra and Petra and his festivals Patricia. Unquote. As we can read in Brian's work, volume 1, page 370. Yes, even Nimrod, under the name Mithras, the S.U.N. sun god, was called Peter. Sir James Fraser tells us of this religion of Mithra, the religion of the pagan Peter coming to Rome. Notice it. From the Golden Bow, St. Martin's Edit, Volume 1, page 471, we read, quote, among the gods of Eastern origin who in the decline of the ancient world competed against each other for the allegiance of the West was the old Persian deity of Mithra. The immense popularity of his worship is attested by the monuments illustrative of it which have been found scattered in profusion all over the Roman pagan empire. In respect both of doctrines and of rites, the cult of Mithra appears to have presented many points of resemblance, not only to the religion of the mother of the gods, but also to Christianity. Unquote. Now, how are Catholics are going to accept Peter worship? Easy, as we can see. What he means is that the Christianity of the 3rd and 4th centuries had already by that time inherited so much from pagan beliefs that this Peter religion coming from the East found many similarities with Roman Christianity. Roman Christianity is apostate Christianity, as Henry Gretton Guinness tells us in his book Romanism and the Reformation. Yeah? Roman Christianity is apostate Christianity. The Catholics had already, by this late date, accepted the pagan festivals of Christmas, their Saturnalia, or Easter, and a host of other rituals and beliefs. Now Fraser continues in his work and says, quote, Taking all together, the coincidences of a Christian with the heathen festivals are too close and too numerous to be accidental." Unquote. So in other words, it is not an accident that we today celebrate Christmas, Christ Mass, where the pagan Romans had the feast of the unconquerable sun god, where the Mithra cult was worshipping the unconquerable sun, 25th of December, the winter solstice very close by, three days as they teach that the sun is not moving one degree neither to the south nor to the north, but where the sun is dead for three days on the 22nd, 23rd and 24th of December. 
and the 25th of December is the very first day when the Sun moves one degree back to the north to come to the northern hemisphere. If you want to believe this BS, you also have to believe, of course, that the world is probably running with 66,000 miles through the quote-unquote universe. Yeah? Chasing, I don't know what, um, anyway, and evolving around, it, uh, uh, revolving around itself. Well, yeah, if you want to believe that, I have a bridge on the moon to, 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 to sell you too, because then you're going to buy that one too, and I can, I can use the money, I can tell you. But we have to understand what Brian says here, uh, what Fraser says here. Taking altogether the coincidences of the Christian with the heathen festivals are too close and too numerous to be accidental. We can not emphasize this enough, that the pagans just took their festivals and then quote-unquote Christianized them. That's what they did with Saturnalia with Christmas, that's what they did with Passover with Easter, and so on and so on and so on. It was this pagan Mithraism which gave the most to quote-unquote Christianity, to Roman Christianity, to apostate Christianity. That's the way we have to read this. Now Brian shows that the chief name of Mithra in the East was Peter or Peter. Quote, his temples were Petra and Petra and his festivals Patricia, unquote, as we read already earlier, the same quote in this book. Everything connected with this ancient pagan religion, everything can be traced right back to the original Peter, the original interpreter of the mysteries, who was none other than Nimrod. This is the same mystery system which the Roman Catholics have absorbed taken in completely, sucked it up, hook, line and sinker. And that's why Roman Catholics are no Christians in the sense that we understand Christianity. Yeah? We have to get that into our mind. He also sits in Peter's chair, the author continues. No wonder the Roman Catholic Church claims to sit in Peter's chair and that the chief temple of the world is today called St. Peter's. That church has accepted the practices and symbols of the oldest pagan religion on earth, Peter worship, the religion of Nimrod. Now this pagan religion was believed and practiced long before Christ ever told the Apostle Peter and the other Apostles that they were to have the keys of the Kingdom of Heaven, as we can read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Satan counterfeited God's true religion centuries before Christ came. This was Satan's attempt to smother God's true religion with a counterfeit that to the untrained eye looks genuine. He did this principally through Simon Magus, Peter, Peter, Simon, Peter the Magus, who, amalgate, who am, amalgamated all the pagan religions into one universal, see or speak, Catholic religion and called the system Christianity. Now the Bible tells us to come completely out of this false religious system, masquerading under the name of Christianity. Revelation chapter 18 verse 4 We are to get back to the faith once delivered to the saints. We can thank God for His goodness in giving us and giving to His church the truth. Sorry. We can thank God for His goodness in giving to His church the truth to us who we are, the body of Christ on earth. Now, Simonites establish universal church, the followers of Simon Magus, that is, Simonites. Elevating his personal teachings above the Bible and preaching a no-works doctrine of salvation, Simon Magus soon had a universal popular following. Deified by the Romans, he was buried on Vatican Hill, 
read how it happened in this coming article. Simon Magus, just like his Samaritan forefathers, deliberately blended together the teachings of Babylon with biblical phrases. In other words, for the people who want it more clearly spoken, Simon Magus blended together the holy with the profane, something that God is absolutely against and which he warns of numerous, I think even probably uncountable times in his word. Do not mix the truth with the lie. Do not mix the holy with the profane. Because a little leaven will spoil the whole bunch. Comment. Please. You just spoiled my ending comments. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because I was Good just uh, getting the idea what's uh, all behind it. Because you see that the... Roman Catholic Church for America, for, for the United States of America, for example, um, has had to offer a compromise. So they mix the holy with the profane in order to mix together with the evangelic or Protestant church for the so-called uh, ecumenical movement. Okay? But on the other hand, the origin of that is also that in the times of uh, Constantine, uh, they were mixing the Mitras religion with, uh, with the Christ religion to make ends meet, to have a compromise, to mix the holy with the profane. And that was just uh, popped into my mind and I found it a very good end credit. But okay, I have to look for another comment. I'm sorry but I took that away <laughs> from you, brother. I had no idea. <laughs> but but the point that you are making, and uh, let's turn to this work from Ralph Woodrow here, the point that you are making is one that you can uh, perfectly read about in Ralph Woodrow's work, Babylon, Mystery, Religion, Ancient and Modern, about mm -hmm. how, at the time of Constantine, the pagan rites and rituals were uh, wrapped around Christianity. And by this way, Christianity, quote-unquote, baptized the old pagan Roman system. This is this whole book all about. I mean, for people who do not know it, when we just have a look at, uh, at the content of the book, Babylon is the source of all false religion we read in the first chapter. Then we read about mother and child worship. Mary worship, saints, saints' days and symbols, obelisks, temples and powers. Is the cross really a Christian symbol? We read about Constantine and the cross and his um, revelation he had at the Milvian Bridge. The relics of Romanism, the religious fraud, was Peter the First Pope, pagan origin of papal office, papal immorality, are popes really infallible, the human inquisition, Lords of a God's heritage, an unmarried priesthood, the Mass, three days and three nights. The question is solved. How could Jesus Christ be crucified on Friday and rise up on uh, Sunday and then be um, dead for 36 hours, as he said himself he would be? Impossible. This is something we will day in three, uh, learn in three days and three nights. A very interesting chapter. Fish Friday and the Spring Festival and the Winter Festivals. And of course here with Fish Friday and the Spring Festival, this is about Easter. And the Winter Festival, this is about the Winter Solstice, this is about the Saturnalia. This is about how uh, the pagan Roman Empire adopted things from Christianity into their own. And we all know, of course, that Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th of December. We know that because we understand Daniel chapter 9 verses uh, 24 through 27 completely correct. And we, how we understand it, we understand it completely correct. And then uh, there is no way that Jesus Christ was born in the middle of, uh, in the middle of December. And uh, this is something that we will learn here. So I can tell you, uh, going to read this book, Babylon Mystery Religion by Ralph Woodrow, 
is a very interesting task to do. That's why I took it on me already some years ago, and I'm quite sure that if I read it today, I would probably add much more comments, many more comments to my reading as I did at that time, but you know, uh, I, I don't go back to my vomit like a dog. I done that work, I did that work, and I'm now I'm going to go on. But chapter 10 we are going to read again, and he makes it very clear in his Babylon Mystery Religion, Ralph in this t in this case, how the mixing of the holy with the profane is on the basis of the Roman Catholic Church as we know it today. So that's a very interesting and valid point you made there, Michael. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, okay. Sorry, I took away your end comment. No, 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 I got, <laughs> a, I got another one already. <laughs> <laughs> you got another one already? Another one is coming up soon. Okay, then let's yeah. see. We still have a 15 minutes or so in okay. the reading before we come to the end, so you can still prepare that a little bit more, and I hope I don't spoil <laughs> it for you again. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> so, Simonites... Simonites establish the universal church. I'm going to just go a little bit again and reading this last sentence again. Simon Magus, just like his Samaritan forefathers, deliberately blended together the teachings of Babylon with biblical phrases. He mixed the holy with the profane. One of his main intentions was to appropriate a Christian vocabulary to the Babylonian ceremonial system. In other words, he kept on with his heathenism, but now called his system Christian in origin. Let's go on. Quote, from the Dictionary of Christian Biography, Volume 4, page 683, tells us, But he, speaking of Simon, Simon Magus, promised that the world should be dissolved, and that those who were his own should be redeemed. So that's why the Pope says that in Unam Sanctam, as Michael mentioned earlier already, I think it was Michael, right? Yes. You mentioned Unam Sanctam, or was it Brad who mentioned Unam Sanctam? No, no, Sanctum? no, it was Michael. It was Michael, it was okay, me. thanks. Um, 1302. What? 1302. Yeah, yeah, 1302 yeah. by Pope Boniface VIII, yeah. uh, who wrote the bull Unam Sanctam, in which he stated that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. So, this is what Simon already promised, that the world should be dissolved, and that those who were his own, those who are subject to the Roman pontiff, be redeemed, get salvation. And accordingly, he, this uh, quote continues, his priests, Irenaeus tells us, yes, Simon established a priesthood, let lascivious lives, used magic and incantations, made filters, had familiar spirits, by whose aid they were able to trouble with dreams those whom they would. They had images of Simon and Helen in the forms respectively of Jupiter and Minerva." Unquote. Now Simon was honored as J.U. Peter. People who had demonic powers, as Simon did, were honored as gods in the first century. Even sacrifices were offered to them. Does this seem unlikely? Well, then read Acts chapter 14 verses 11 through 13. Well, when you ask me this kindly, I will do so. Let's go. Book of Acts chapter 14 verses 11 and thir uh, through 13, where we can read and when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people priest of Jupiter. This is what the 1611 King James Bible says. What does the author say? People who had demonic powers, as Simon did, were honored as gods. Jupiter is a god. And even sacrifices were offered to them, as he offers, uh, offers to do sacrifices. 
So, Acts chapter 14, verses 11 through 13 confirm anything Ernest L. Martin says here. Now, after seeing the great miracles that Paul and Barnabas had done through the Holy Spirit, as we just read in Acts, Luke says, when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Laconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men, and they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury. Then the priests of Jupiter came out to offer them sacrifice, as we just read in the King James Bible. Paul and Barnabas rent their clothes at such action. Why? Because they won't be taken for gods. But what could Simon Magus have done? Or rather, what did Simon Magus do? He let the Roman Senate, with the approval of the Emperor Claudius, deify him as a god and erect a statue to him. And the people who followed Simon called him J.U. Peter, at the same time calling themselves <laughs> Christians. The statue that must have been dedicated to Simon was in the likeness of the chief god of the pagan world, the god that desolated the holy place in God's temple, J. Jupiter Capitolinus. Now we come to the death of Simon Magus. Let me just take another picture here. The records regarding Simon's death vary widely. Many of the stories try to incorporate some fiction from the Greek and Egyptian myths to enhance the reader's interest in this fascinating character. But the earliest records say that he was buried in Rome after a long period of great honor and deification. It is not clearly known where Simon Magus alias Simon Peter or Simon J.U. Peter was buried, but this much is known. The place of burial for all prophets and holy men of the pagan Romans was in the sacred cemetery on Vatican Hill. This much is certain. All other gossip away. Now notice what Werner Keller in his The Bible as History says about the so-called burial of the Catholics Peter. Before reading Keller's statements, let us remember that he is a thoroughgoing Catholic and firmly himself believed that the Apostle Peter was buried in Rome. However, the Bible shows nothing of the kind as we have been proven all 12 foregoing broadcasts anyway. So now let's read Keller's comment in the official comment of the Roman Catholic Church. Quote, on the night of his death on the cross, Peter's followers buried his body. As in the case of Jesus on the hill of Calvary, it was wrapped in linen and secretly taken to a pagan burial ground on the Via Cornelia, behind the stone structure of the arena. This pagan cemetery lay on a knoll called Vaticanus. The Latin word Vatus means a prophet or soothsayer. In days gone by there had been an Etruscan oracle on this spot." Unquote. What an admission! Keller ought to have better sense to know that this Peter buried in this cemetery of all places could not be the Apostle Peter. In the first place Peter was a Jew and they had to be buried in their own cemeteries. And even if by a happen chance a Jew could be buried in a Roman cemetery, it is most unlikely that a Jew, especially one who attacked the Roman religion as the Apostle Peter did, would ever have been allowed into the most holy of pagan cemeteries. This cemetery was reserved for prophets, soothsayers and the great ones of pagan Rome. It would be as sensible to say that Hitler could find a place of burial in Westminster Abbey. And two, can you imagine true Christians searching out a pagan cemetery, the chief one in which to bury the chief Christian apostle, the inveterate enemy of paganism? This place 
of all places could not be the place of the Apostle Peter's burial, even if he had been in Rome. But there is really no better place for the burial of Simon Magus. He had been and was being honored as a god not only by the people of Rome, but even by the Emperor and the whole Senate. That makes me think of 2015, when the Antichrist was visiting a joint session between the, uh, of the Senate and the Congress in the United States of America, and all the people of America accepted the Antichrist as God on earth. Yes, the author continues, Keller and his Catholic friends would have undoubtedly found a Simon, but not the Apostle Peter. And with this, I'm going to close down the reading for today, the 13th reading of Simon Peter meets the competition, Peter was never in Rome, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. And I will turn to my two wonderful friends, and brothers in Christ who accompany me via Skype on this wonderful call and this wonderful reading. And first, of course, we want to see if Michael has already found another closing okay. remark. Please, brother. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I am beginning to wonder if there is uh, some intention behind the word or the mixed up uh, with Peter and Peter and Petrus and and what else, so that the common people uh, think it's uh, the meaning is uh, is nearly the same as the Jew Peter and Peter and the Simon Peter and Peter and etc etc. I'm beginning to think that there is some in some evil intention behind it, so that uh, people can be deceived more easily because you see that for. Uh, the most part of the crowd of the common people, uh, it's okay. Uh, they worship a god, and uh, yeah, which kind of uh, what what god, what kind of god? It's maybe in, of not that much importance for them. It's just uh, called Peter God, and and so it's okay. What are your opinion about it? Well, you know that in that system of Roman Catholicism, you have a inner teaching and an outer teaching. You have esoteric and exoteric knowledge. And this is a prime example, in my, uh, in my humble opinion, to tell the quote-unquote people who like to adhere to the Jesus of the Bible and call themselves Christians, to lure them into the Roman Catholic belief system by telling them that they are the successor of Peter, that they are the true apostolic church, which they are not, by using an exoteric, mean outside teaching that has is, is absolutely the opposite of the inside teaching, and the inside teaching, the esoteric teaching, only gives away the real roots of that religion. That's mm. my short stance on that, Michael. Okay. But maybe maybe you want to ask uh, Brett the same question. I don't know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, you know, because... Um, uh, could you phrase that question again, please? <laughs> it's just that I, I, I'm I suspicious about the intention of uh, the mixing of Simon Peter and Simon Magus uh, with the... Um, it's a similarity of the pronunciation. And if you look upon the Peter or Peter or Jew Peter, there's always a Peter in it. So that for the most part of the of the people, uh, it's okay. They think they know, but they are being deceived because it just sounds similar, but it's not actually it's not the same oh, thing. Oh yes, I so get that, you. So that that that's my that's my thing because you see, um, even. Even if we are getting confused with so many Peters around it and, and with so many um, uh, meanings behind it, then what will the ordinary people make up with it? So Well, that's a really good point because it's just adding more layers of confusion on top of something that's already just so mangled and mixed up that 
it's hard to see clearly. Well, this is a, another good reason why history is so vitally important to get a, a basic viewpoint of what cornerstone we're building our faith on, what manuscripts we use to understand what God was trying to tell us through the witnesses that followed him. So we have all these false witnesses and false beliefs and all of this tradition. And I mean, it's really horrible when you stack all this up and then you add on the top of that um, living here in America and what the American influence has become on the world then it really becomes confusing. You know, I've only been to Europe once, and when I was there, I was just awestruck by how different it was over there compared to here mm. um, in many regards. And that was when I was 20 years old. Um, so I can't imagine, you know, going back over there now and just trying to live for a few weeks and, and just kind of take it in all over again, um, how much different it would be because of all of the, the different uh, ideologies that have uh, been uh, foisted upon us since that time. So, you know, when Antichrist came over here to a joint session of Congress to give his speech, like Yerk was pointing out, uh, this was... Uh, very telling about the leadership of this country because our country basically has given in and has been promoting this freedom of religion ever since its founding for the very principle of allowing the Catholic faith a foothold and by allowing that foothold it has allowed this uh, freedom of religion. And it gets really confusing, and it really shouldn't be, because, you know, if we were to look at the, the more critical aspects of this history, which, you know, uh, Yerk and Tom have done on their readings and, and discussions for all these years, really, since this uh, 2015 visit of this Antichrist that we know and biblically it really adds up and it really packs a punch and it just what well, just really drives it home that uh yeah we're in a load of trouble and we're in a load of hurt because america is basically leading the whole world to worship this fallen uh system of worship you know this this beast so yeah i mean it's uh when you really take it in it really is something but you, it takes a long time to look at the study and to uh consider the historical aspects of it right mm -hmm. i think i think what you mean is that it take it takes very much time to go beyond oh, that yes. yes and to um, yeah, to, to 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 uncover the truth, and I think you will agree on a very famous quote of an American. Um, yeah, I don't uh, I don't have to mention his name. It goes like, uh, break breakthroughs are available to those who can remove one of the truth protective layers. <laughs> 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 yeah, so. You see, there are many issues where you have um, the official meaning on the surface, but beyond that you will discover that there is a complete opposite meaning beyond that. So I think that for most people um, it's too complicated and too time-wasting to discover that. Uh, and so they, they think, okay, uh, the, the people are, which are telling that, the priests and the Pope and the Cardinals, yeah, they know their stuff, they know their Bible. Who am I to 
have another different opinion because the or Romans to, the, to actually confront yeah. and to challenge the status quo of the system. Basically. Yeah, because because the Roman Catholic Church insists that only their priests can uh, interpret the the Bible accordingly. Exactly. So so it's 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 no use to 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 have a what uh, what what what's the phrase of of the Pope? Uh, it's dangerous to have a direct relationship with Jesus Christ. Something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's dangerous to his system, of course. Yeah, makes perfect sense yeah. from both perspectives, actually, because uh, he's the god of this world, and and down with the ship he will go when Christ returns. So, yeah, yeah, yeah he will. Th he'll he'll be numero numero uno, as they say. Numero uno. That was an Austrian, <laughs> that was a very strong Austrian guy, which claimed that he was numero uno. Arnold is numero uno. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. Okay, but I think we all agree on that. That uh, yeah, that there, are, that there are quite fascinating stuff to uh, can be explored uh, beyond the surface, uh, which is presented by not only the Roman Catholic Church but also for many other denominations and um, governments and so on and and so on. It just uh, they are just two separate kind of people. The first one is uh, people like us who like to study to go very deep into a subject. But most of the people I regret are people who are just consuming, who won't get deep into anything because yes. it's just yes. a very... Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's stressful and... It's, That's right, uh, it because if no, you get too yeah. deep... If then, you get too deep, then you have to start being a responsible, uh, biblical, uh, you know, actually adhering to what the Word of God says and challenging one another on that basis. Yeah, yeah. Also, also, Brett, it's it's just the, the thing that most people don't see their gain in it. They don't see a benefit. Yeah. Uh, what am I going to do if I know everything? Of course just, not. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. They they don't see any benefit of their material um, orientated life. Right, just because the, just they the haven't matter. read the Bible enough and they haven't considered it no, enough. No, they, they just don't. They just aren't interested in reading anymore. They're interested True. in consuming because you see, if you are if you read an item, your content, you have to focus on it. But if you are just looking at the TV station or smartphone or internet or whatever source yeah you are just consuming you don't have to focus on anything you can do two three four things in, in parallel at the same time so you don't go deep into the subject it's just everything is above the surface and so everything looks smooth and polished and great and soft and sparkling but it's just an illusion. It's mm -hmm. only the illusion which is on top of the surface. And you will never get deep into a subject if you are not putting your effort, your time into, um, into a matter of interest. And if you don't have profound knowledge of an item, you're just swimming below the surface. And you don't get into the, 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 the deepest... Um, deepest truths, and so I think that most people are afraid of the truth because it's just so they are just swimming in so deep waters. They are just afraid that uh, might be sharks, sharks looking and and hunting them. And you see, it's just if you if you read a book, you have to focus on the subject. It just consumes everything: your eyes, your brain, but. On the other hand, if you do not read, and uh, to read is just old-fashioned, it's out of fashion, and so to consume with a stick, with a USB port, with a tablet, etc., etc., you just are being totally deceived because the information that you are getting is just on top of the surface. What I'm trying to tell with this end comment is simply is that, is this, if I would read this book Simon Peter versus Simon Magus for myself, 
I just would also swim on the surface. I would discover this, I would discover that, I would have thought this, I would have thought that. But the reason, one of the reasons I'm joining you and Jörg is to get deep below. And because of your two comments, I can get a very much deeper meaning of this book and also of other lectures than I would go, than I would have if I would do it on my on myself, just alone, in my kitchen, in my in my in my flat, and just uh, looking at the book and oh, okay, hmm, might be this, might be that. But so I'm very grateful that there are so great guys around the, on on this world, like Brad Norman, like Jörg like uh, any anyone else like tom press like our german help mates victor and uh, i forgot uh, yeah, maximilian and so on and so on and so on and many others which i haven't just quite just mentioned yet but i'm mm -hmm. so grateful that we are helping each other out to get the deeper meaning and to get the, the right meaning because we can only if we are studying the subject and we are precise in our judgments and are precise in our quotes, then we are able to teach others. But not yes. if we are swimming on the surface, so we are we, we are talking the same blah blah like most of the other truthers, quote, uh, quote unquote truthers are doing out there because they just have half a knowledge and, and a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and mixing the holy priest profane and I won't do that. Okay, I, I think that was a very long end comment. Yeah, sometimes you have to get that off your chest. <laughs> yeah. Brad, is there something no you want to say for the end, or you just uh, agree with I think Michael that here? summed it up just perfect. Yeah. Thank so, you, Michael. Let me just sum it up a little bit in a few words. We always have to remember that the Roman Catholic Church is the biggest secret society on earth, and that they are like Janus, one of their major gods, are two-faced and they have an outer teaching and they have an inner teaching. And because they keep the people stupid and uninterested in these subjects, it is easy for them to lure them into their churches and to lure them into their religious system and by making the people think that they are worshipping the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, they are so successful by playing a theater before the eyes of the people because they are just gullible and they just want everything presented to them on a silver platter. They don't want to do what Michael said, the studies for themselves. They surely do not want to pick up the book and read for themselves. And this is the main reason why Tom Fress from Inquisition Update reads book after book after book after book on his broadcasts to bring the knowledge to the people who are too lazy to do the studies and reading on their own. And this is the same reason why I bring these books, because it is maybe more quote-unquote entertaining when you can learn in this way on YouTube. But what you have to keep in mind is the most profound message that we want to share with you always. And that is, read your Bible. If you are not so familiar in reading historical books, history books, Protestant books from Henry Grattan Guinness, James Edgar Wiley, uh, sermons from Charles Spurgeon and other people who made themselves a name in the body of Christ the last few hundred years, then at least turn to the 1611 King James authorized version of the Bible and read and study the Word of God and everything else and every interest else but reading the Bible will come out of the Bible reading itself. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, God says. And to fear the Lord, you first have to know the Lord. And to know the Lord, there is only one way. Read his word. Until next time, Maranatha. Heart, there is no
Psalm 14 verse 1.